Name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey. Then count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Good morning. It's great to see you here this morning, and uh, if you're visiting with us, again, you're an honored guest. We really appreciate you coming and worshiping God here at North Highlands with us this morning. And again, please stick around for a little while afterwards so that we might shake your hand and, and greet you and thank you for being with us today. Uh, if you have your smartphone or other device, you can follow along with the lesson in the version notes, and I encourage you to do that and uh, maybe use that again later in the week. This will be a great week for a family devotional, a family time to talk about what you're thankful for and count your many blessings as a family together and uh, look at all that God has done and is doing in your life as a family. So this morning we're going to take a glimpse at Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, this is my favorite uh, holiday, my favorite time of the year. And I really look forward to this, getting to spend time with family and and uh, eat good food and just be around one another. And so I know that you enjoy it too. And many of us probably have plans. Remember that this week we won't meet on Wednesday night. We're going to meet on Tuesday night. And so be here on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And also I have a special announcement. Uh, Leanne Moore has uh, placed membership with us. She is John Atkins' uh, fiance. And uh, she's sitting right over there. I told her I wouldn't make her stand up. But everybody knows who Leanne is most, uh, most likely. And so give her a hug and, and uh, welcome her appropriately uh, to North Highlands family. Um, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. In verse 13 and following, and uh, we'll start off our lesson right there. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. You notice what increases? Do you notice why it is that uh, this thanksgiving increases? It's because Christians are telling others what God has done for them. It's because, and it's based on us, those of us who believe in Jesus, those of us who are, are striving to walk in the light, telling others, vocalizing our praise of God for what He has done in our life. And there are so many things that we could look at, that we could consider as we think about things that we should be grateful for, things that we are, are ready to thank God for. And really the foundation of our gratitude, as he points out in this passage, it is the cross of Christ. It is the fact that Jesus took our place. It's no wonder that Calvary is the blazing center of the glory of God. And so as we express gratefulness, as we express our awe-inspired appreciation to God our Father, we remember the agony of the Savior on the cross. It's always in the back of our minds as a catalyst to our praise for the fact that He has saved us 
from ourselves. That he has paid the price that we couldn't pay. That he has uh, given us a gift by faith, by grace through faith. That he has given this to us that we might stand with him <clears throat> in eternity. And he says, now, because of this, based on this truth, now you tell someone else, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe. And so we speak knowing, knowing that God who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us up. And so let's look at a few glimpses of thanksgiving that really we see often through the year. Uh, that as we go through the year, we can use to bring praise to God and help others recognize that He's blessing us and that He's blessing them. It happens every day. And we should be so thankful. First, you know, triumph over sickness. I was just sick a couple of weeks ago and it was miserable. But that sickness is a reminder of the fact that I'm also sick of and with sin. And that Jesus is the remedy for that sickness. He's the remedy for that sin. Uh, but over in Luke chapter 17, here Jesus heals some lepers, 10 lepers. Notice what it says. On the way to Jerusalem, in Luke 17 verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, he was met by 10 lepers. And they stood at a distance. They lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Is no one, was, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to the Samaritan, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. You see, Jesus gave him an instruction and this leper, along with those others, they complied with the instruction that Jesus gave. They had obedient faith. They believed that what he was telling them was something that was for them, was, was something that would possibly heal them. And so they obediently did what he said. And as they did it, they were healed. But only one turned back. Only one came back to say thank you. Only one uh, praised God running back to the Savior to tell him thank you. He had overcome sickness in the name of Jesus by the miracle of Jesus. He had overcome. And so what did he automatically do? He praised God. What a wonderful thing to do. What a wonderful thing uh, to, to express to another person. I believe and therefore I speak. What do you believe? I believe that Jesus is the healer. I believe that Jesus is the great physician. I believe that Jesus can overcome my sickness and that he can help me overcome in this world. Isn't it our victory over sin? Isn't that victory over the, the, the sickness of sin that we praise him for? In Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, Romans 6 and verse 17, it says, But thanks be to God, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Remember those lepers, they were told, go and show yourselves to the priest. And so as they put into practice the command that they were given, they were healed. And this is what he says. He says, look, you were once slaves of sin, but you've become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. You've heard, you've believed, you've put your faith in Christ. And so you have behaved or you have done those things that are commanded through the Scriptures. Verse 18, and having been set free from sin, having been set free from that sickness, you have become slaves of righteousness. Verse 19 says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. You know, just like those lepers as they were going along the road, uh, we're going along the load, road of life. And as we go along that road, we need to continually praise God. 
We need to continually turn back to Him. We need to continually repent of those things that are not in the way of the Lord and, and continue to do those things that are. And as we do that, He says, just like those lepers were healed, we're sanctified. We're sanctified by the Spirit as we walk in the light, as we walk according to His way, as we put into practice those things in our life that we read Him teaching us through the Bible. And so let's do those things. And let's be obedient to the faith that has been delivered to us. Notice then in verse 22 it says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says if you stay on this path, of righteousness. If you stay on this path of the light, if you continue to obediently follow the instructions of Christ, you know where it leads? It doesn't end in sanctification. It doesn't end in salvation from the sin. It doesn't end here. It leads to an eternal life. It leads to life everlasting. It leads to even more wonders in the presence of God. So let's recognize this world for what it really is. In Philippians 3 and verse 8, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul said, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. I count them as garbage in order that I may gain Christ. He says, Christ is all that really matters in this world. Christ is all that matters, and He gives me a triumph. Not only over sickness, he gives me a triumph over sin. The sickness that will condemn me in the end if I haven't turned my life over to Jesus Christ. So triumph over sickness. It's something to be thankful for. It's something to talk about over the table this Thursday, isn't it? It's something to to make sure others know who you praise for your healing. Jesus It's Jesus who has healed us and it's Jesus who continually sanctifies us as we walk in the light that he is in. Secondly, reunion with loved ones. This this, uh, idea of of giving praise to God, causing thanksgiving, uh, brings us into reunions with loved ones. I can't help but think of Jacob and Joseph. Jacob, uh, of course, was hated by his brothers because his father Joseph loved him so much. And he was sold into slavery. And, and, and he, he lived this way. He was thrown into prison, falsely accused of things. He, he, he went through horrors in life. And yet, through the whole time, his father believed that he had died. Even though his son was alive, he thought he was dead. He'd given up on him. He was told by his other sons, he's dead. And so he just lived his life as if that son had died. And yet, he was alive the whole time. He was always there. Notice in Genesis 46 and verse 29, it says, Joseph prepared his chariot and he went up to meet Israel, his father in Goshen. You see, the day came when those brothers came and had to to beg for some food because of the famine, right? And they come and Joseph, uh, through the providence of God, has become second in command in all of Egypt. And here's Joseph, their brother, whom they sold into slavery. And he's the one who can save their lives. Who can save so many more lives. And does because of the providence of God. He does it. But he's reunited with his father through that connection. And and of course the whole family comes down to live in Egypt with him. uh, To be under his care. But here in Genesis 46... He finally sees his father. His father finally sees the son whom he loved, the one who he thought had died. It says he presented himself to Joseph. He fell on his neck. He wept on his neck a good while. In verse 30, Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. He says, My life is fulfilled. Everything in my life is fulfilled because of this reunion with this loved one. My life has purpose now. My life means something. Now I can die in peace because I've been reunited with my son who I love so much. I can't imagine the anguish of this reunion. It said that he wept on him for some time. 
This embrace that this father and son enjoyed with one another. One who thought the other was dead and the other who thought the other one would never see him again. But you know, we find out that they had about 17 years together in Egypt. And Jacob got to know Joseph's sons, his grandsons too. He got to spend time with that family. For 17 years, this relationship was able to grow again and was enjoyed by these two. This father and this son. Makes you think of another father and son, doesn't it? The prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15, as you read about this son who was so selfish and he said, Father, just give me my inheritance now. I, I know I'll get it when you die, but I want it now. And this loving father, he gave the son what he wanted. And the son left and he wasted everything that he had in prodigal living. And he, he wasted all that his father had worked so hard for and he just threw it all away and he ends up in a pigsty wishing that he could have the food that the pigs were eating because he was so hungry because he had nothing. So while he's there, the Bible says he came to himself. He realized he should go and ask if he could just be a servant in his father's house because he knew he didn't, he didn't deserve. He, didn't, he, he shouldn't even consider himself as a son after what he had done to his father, after wasting all that his father had given him. It says in Luke 15 and verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He felt compassion. He ran and embraced his son. He kissed his son. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. And they began to celebrate. He didn't even hear his son's speech about how unworthy he was anymore. He just said, I, my son is back. And I love him. And there was a great reunion. And this is a picture all of these, these stories through the Scriptures are to teach us about our reunion with our Father. Our Father God. Even though we've sinned and even though we've been selfish and even though uh, we don't deserve to be called His children, He still reaches out. He calls us sons. He calls us daughters. He still reaches out and with love in His heart offers us salvation. He gives us what we need instead of what we deserve. He gives us His love. He wants to be with you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved from Him, by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be, we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We have now received reconciliation. See, your Father, He, he literally, He stands as your heavenly Father with His arms outstretched, calling you home. Showing His love to you in every breath. Uh, showing his, his patience with you in every day reminding you that there is a reunion coming where you get to stand with your Father, where you get to be embraced by a loving Father, when you get to be embraced by the Creator of the universe, the One who loves you so much that He gave Jesus, He gave Himself, that you might be saved. He took your place so that you could be with Him. The fact is, we deserve punishment for our sin. We deserve death. And yet Jesus took that punishment. Jesus died that death so that we could enjoy reunion. So that we could be in the presence of the most holy God. In John chapter 14 and verse 19, uh, as, as Jesus is teaching here, He's helping us to understand that God wants to make His home with you here and now. It says, yet in a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, 
He it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone comes to me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Do you remember the lepers? Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. And they started on their way in obedient faith. They did what they were told. And just as Romans chapter 6, the Holy Spirit teaches us that the sanctification of the Spirit comes as we walk in the light, as we choose to obey Jesus Christ, as we live a life in accordance with His Word. And here He says, here He teaches us, as you're going on that way, as you're going according to God's plan in the way of life, on this journey of life, as you're accomplishing those things that God prepared beforehand for you to do in this world to make it better, to lift up others, He says, I'm making my home in you. I'm sanctifying you by my presence that you might praise me, that you might glorify me, that you might show others the glory of God in your very life because He wants to be reunited with you. You see, it's heaven on earth. It's eternity in His presence. It's something that you have now as you stand in the presence of God, in the presence of your Savior Jesus. And last this morning, I'm so thankful for our resurrection from death. Our resurrection from death, which really is... is is woven all through thanksgiving in everything that we're thankful for. It goes back to the cross. It goes back to the resurrection. It goes back to what Jesus accomplished for us. And this is our victory, Christians. Lazarus, he had died. Jesus got there. Uh, Jesus got there and, and, and Mary and Martha, they thought it was too late that he would... He had not gotten there in time to save Lazarus. But Lazarus enjoyed a physical resurrection based on the miracle of Jesus. And and Jesus uh, said, come out. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus rose from the dead and he walked out and he proved to everyone who was there he had the power over death. uh, That this man who was God... Uh, could command even a dead body to take life again and walk out and be who he was before. That he might enjoy life again. And Jesus knew his friend's death was this opportunity to glorify God. He, He was even shedding his own tears over his friend's death. Jesus wept. But he knew. But he knew this would bring glory to God. You know, in Psalm 116 and verse 15, the Holy Spirit tells us, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You see, the pain of separation cannot compare to the joy of resurrection. And we, as Lazarus enjoyed that physical resurrection, we enjoy a spiritual resurrection, don't we? We enjoy a spiritual resurrection uh, from the sin that kept us from seeing what was right and kept us from doing what was right. The sting, the hopelessness of death, it's removed and we're forgiven in Christ because He is risen. Uh, Notice what we're we're taught in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? He says, this isn't the path you were made for. You weren't made for the path of sin and death. You weren't made to continue to walk that direction. No, Jesus has given you a better instruction. So turn and walk a different direction. Walk in His direction. Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with uh, with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. He says you can be resurrected too. You can have the power of God in your spirit. You can have the power of God to overcome sickness, uh, to enjoy the reunion you have with loved ones, and you can look forward to a resurrection even from death. That seems like the end, but it's not. I want to encourage you, as you enjoy Thanksgiving this week, 
as you think about these glimpses of Thanksgiving and the moments that we share all year long, these little reminders of the glory that is to come for the faithful Christian, as you enjoy Thanksgiving, what is it that you'll tell your family about? What is it that you'll praise God for in the presence of others? What is it that you'll bring glory to His name uh, for all that He's accomplished in your life? How is it that you'll thank Him and influence other hearts with the joy of the Lord? I encourage you, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, come to Christ in obedient faith. Just as He instructed those lepers to, to go, He's instructing you. But He's instructing you to come. He's telling you to come if you've heard about Jesus, if you believe that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God. He's inviting you to repent, to quit walking down the wrong path and start walking down His path to confess that He truly is who He said He was, the Son of the living God. He's inviting you to be immersed. Just as He died and was buried and rose, He tells us to be baptized, to die to ourselves, to be buried in a watery grave and to rise up out of it. To walk a new life, a Christian life. And so I encourage you, come to Jesus. If you are a Christian, there's things on your heart. There's thanksgiving that needs to be made. Make it loud. Make it loud and let your Lord know all that you're thankful for. Tell those who are around you and encourage them to praise God also. Whatever your need is, won't you come while we stand and we sing?